Would you please join me in, in the invitation to worship? Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. The love of his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. I'd like to invite the children to join me for the children's message. All right, high five. How are we doing today? Good. Good, all right. Well, today I brought with me a, a paper. Does anybody know what, what is on this paper? Scribble draft. Scribble no, okay. <laughs> football teams, okay. This is the college football rankings, the, the AP poll, okay. And this tells us every Sunday who are, are the best teams in the country, so we got Alabama, we got Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State, LSU. You like Georgia? Okay. Well, it seems to me like sometimes the same teams are always on here, but that's okay because every Sunday comes out a new rankings. And every Sunday they look at the games from yesterday and teams uh, change in, in, in the poll, okay? So, so who knows? Uh, when your team wins, what, what happens to your ranking? Do you know? Does it go up or down? It goes up. Good job. And when your team loses, what happens to the ranking? Down. It goes down. That, that's right. Very good. Well, today we're going to talk about how sometimes in life, going up is losing and going down is actually winning. 
So that's what we're going to talk about today. Jesus gave us uh, a message, and he said, I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus went down, and he invites us to go down, too. So would you pray with me? Dear God, we love you. We thank you for this day that you have blessed us with. Teach us to be your servants. Lord, in our schools and in our homes and then everywhere we go, may you tell, teach us to honor you. And may you teach us to put others first. In your name we pray. Amen. You'll have a good week.
Would you please join me as we read in unison Revelation 15, 3 and 4, as printed in your bulletin. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Amen. Please join me in uh, the scripture reading this morning. It's found in your bulletin from Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Please join me in the uh, bold print. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Amen. Join me in the offertory prayer, please. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. You are an abundant God, and out of your mercies, you have given us much. We come humbly, so thankful for the blessings you have given us and will be given us daily. We give you this offering today with our worship. May it be used for your kingdom and your glory. Extend and multiply it. Make it a blessing to many. We ask in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
Our passage this morning comes from Luke chapter 12. I'll begin reading in verse 11. Jesus said, When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. And someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to, invite, to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed, for life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told him this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come to you this morning as your people, as your servants. We ask that you would give us eyes to see, that you would give us ears to hear, that you would give us feet that are ready to go, that you would transform our hearts, that you would transform us into the likeness of your Son. We ask all this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. This, this weekend, Matt is in uh, Norman, Oklahoma, preaching this morning at First Baptist Norman. Uh, let's all hope together that he's preaching a sermon on mercy. <laughs> we could have used some mercy from the city of Norman, Oklahoma yesterday. Well, today I will be wrapping up uh, our series called Pillars. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about what it means to be the church and what our corporate life together looks like. And so over the past six weeks, we've talked about a number of the basic functions of the church, the pillars that, that keep us standing as the people of God, such as worship or generosity or, or fellowship. And today we come to the final peer, pillar of our series, and that's witness. Now, witness is unique among the pillars because it refuses to stay on the front porch. You see, I like to think of witness as part pillar and part toddler. See, witness is a toddler because it will not stay in one room of the house. It needs to be in every room of the house. And what I mean is that, is that witness is not a mutually exclusive category from all of the others. Witness cannot be reduced to having evangelistic conversations. And so when we talk about generosity, for example, we're also talking about witness. Because when we give freely, we are witnessing to a God who has given freely to us. When we talk about fellowship, we are also talking about witness. Because as we share our lives together, we are witnessing to and imitating a God who has shared his life with us. When we talk about worship, we are again also talking about witness. Because when, our, when God has all of our heart, you are witnessing that he is enough. So yes, witness is a pillar. It's an activity that the church does. But witness is also the toddler that figures out a way to subvert the child locked doors and sneaks into your lap when you thought he was asleep. And no matter how hard you try, he won't stay in his room. He needs to be in everyone's room. See, witness refuses to be just one category of your life. He leaves no category of your life untouched. And that is both burden and opportunity. <laughs> when we think about witness, we tend to, to classify it as what happens outside the walls of the church. And so when we gather here together like we are now, then this is worship and this is fellowship and witness is what happens as soon as we disperse. That's where witness 
begins. But as we've been saying, if, witness, if worship and if fellowship and if generosity can all be forms of witness, then this means that we witness simply by being the church. In his book, Evangelism After Christendom, Brian Stone says this, the church does not really need an evangelistic strategy. The church is the evangelistic strategy. The most evangelistic thing the church can do today is to be the church, a distinctive people in the world, a new social option, the body of Christ. See, when the church is healthy, then witness happens not only when we scatter, but also when we gather. Our passage today explores these boundaries of, of witness as both general and particular, as both corporate and individual, as both words and as way of life. And it begins with Jesus teaching his disciples among the crowd. He's teaching them uh, about witness that their loyalty to him is soon going to create conflict and it's soon going to require courage. When you are brought before the synagogues, the rulers and the authorities, Jesus says, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Yet Jesus' pep talk about be strong, bear witness, the spirit will be with you is, is interrupted from the crowd. Teacher, he hears a voice walking toward him. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. This request was out of place and it could have been easily ignored by Jesus, but Jesus allows himself to be pulled from this conversation of critical importance into this mediation that seems rather trivial. Who appointed me to be a, a judge or an arbiter between you? Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed, for life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus makes two things clear. Number one, I'm not getting involved in this. And number two, if you get involved, you better watch out. And if this warning is not enough, Jesus goes on to tell a story a story about a rich man who reaped an abundant harvest. There, this was no ordinary harvest year. No, this harvest was an abundance. It was a surplus of grain. And this man could have taken this abundance to market, but this rich man knows his economics. He knows that when supply is high, demand is low. And so he better wait till a later time when supply is low and demand will be high. But there's only one problem. This man has, has run out of space. And, and you and I know this feeling, okay, that it happens in our home and it all begins with the drawer of stuff. <laughs> you know that drawer that we all have in our house that holds everything that doesn't really belong anywhere else in the house? The drawer of stuff. And what happens over time is that this drawer of stuff grows to, to two drawers. And then it grows into a closet. And then it has to move into the garage until finally it sprawls out into any corner that it can find open anywhere in our house. Recently, I visited a, a store called the Container Store. Maybe you've been before. What's fascinating about the Container Store is that everything they sell in the Container Store is for the purpose of holding something else. There are aisles and aisles of buckets and bins, of racks and totes, of boxes and trunks. I don't know if the container store has a slogan, but I'd like to give it one. <laughs> stuff to hold your stuff. <laughs> Have you ever been in the place before where you needed to go buy more stuff to hold your stuff? I think we've all been there. And it's funny because I imagine if you can picture for a moment that someplace, somewhere, the container store has a warehouse where they keep... <laughs> where they keep their inventory. And if you can picture it, this, this warehouse is a place to store storage items until they can be stored in our stores 
until they can store our stuff in our homes. Entire systems have been built around our accumulation of stuff. And this is the predicament of the rich man. And so he makes a simple business decision. He says, I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. In other words, I'm going to build bigger stuff to hold more stuff. He has so much grain where we're told that this man can coast for years. He's got cushion to take life easy, to eat, to drink, to be merry. What strikes me about this story is, is how ordinary and, and common sense it is to us today. Of course he held back his surplus. Of course he built a, a bigger barn. Of course he kicked back to enjoy life. That's probably what we would do too. That's just smart, that's what you do. We call that shrewd business practice. And if we're honest, if our life ended up like his, we'd probably feel pretty good about it. Taking life easy sounds like the dream. And yet God does not call this man a, a genius as we might be tempted to. He calls him a fool. See, in Scripture, fool is about the biggest insult that God can give you. A fool is a person who lives his life without reference to God. And why is this man a, a, a fool? Well, verse 20 gives us two reasons. First, this man is a fool because he died that night. That he had no idea it was coming, and, and we never do too. The fool lives as if he will live forever. But a wise man knows that there are an end to his days. And number two follows the first. That this man's death means that every ounce of grain that he had stored up now belongs to somebody else. And if you think about it, we too are nothing more than the current owners of everything that we have. Current owners. That everything we own is either on its way to somebody else or on its way to the landfill. That a fool lives as if he can transcend death but a wise man sees the big picture. And so Jesus ends his story with a haunting phrase. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Henry Nouwen was a fascinating man. He was a Dutch Catholic priest, a professor, a, a writer, and a theologian. And in the prime of his career, this priest was teaching at Harvard Divinity School. He was an internationally sought out speaker. He was a prolific writer. But in 1985, in, in the prime of his career, Henry Nouwen resigned from Harvard and he moved into Daybreak. It was a community for severely disabled adults in Toronto, Canada. Nouwen himself was not disabled, no, he moved into daybreak because he believed that, that this is where he could freshly discover the presence of God. Now, Nowen was accustomed to speaking to, to large crowds of admirers, but now as the resident chaplain at daybreak, he found himself preaching to people who could not understand his big words, who grunted and drooled during his homilies who were often interrupting him with personal comments. Nowen's resume meant nothing to them, that all that mattered to these people was whether he loved them. Nowen was assigned to a specific man in the community named Adam, who was the weakest and the, the most disabled among all the people at daybreak. Philip Yancey writes a biography on, on Henry Nowen, and he writes this about Adam. He says, Although in his 20s, Adam could not speak, dress or undress himself, could not walk alone or eat without help. And so instead of counseling Ivy League students and juggling a busy schedule, now one had to learn a new set of skills, how to feed, change, and bathe Adam, how to support his glass as he drank, how to push his wheelchair over a road full of potholes. 
that he ministered not to leaders and intellectuals, but to a young man who is considered by many to be a vegetable, a useless person who should not have been born. Now and spent 10 years living at daybreak before his early death, and it would be easy to consider his time there a, a, a waste of time and a waste of talent. But now and insisted that he, not Adam, received the primary benefit from their friendship. And that may sound like a trite cliche, but as now and spent hours a day taking care of Adam, that his life began to change. Yancey writes that as he sat beside that silent child man, he realized how obsessive, how marked with rivalry and competition was his prior drive toward success in academia. At a later time, Nowen would, would write these words about why he moved into daybreak. He writes, I love Jesus, but... I love Jesus but I want to hold on to my own independence, even when that independence brings no real freedom. That I love Jesus, but I, I do not want to lose the respect of my professional colleagues, even though the respect does not make me grow spiritually. That I love Jesus, but do not want to give up my writing plans, my travel plans, my speaking plans, even when those plans are often more to my glory than to the glory of God. Now and since he needed a change in his life. And daybreak allowed now and to escape the fast paced and frenzied life that constantly demanded that he prove himself. It shattered his need for success and it taught him to love. And now and began to write about a concept that he called downward mobility. Now, you, you've heard of upward mobility for the, before, the drive to move up in the world, but this is downward mobility, and it's best explained through the life of a man who gave up a tenure position at Harvard to live among the mentally challenged. In my office at my previous church in Morgantown, I, I kept a picture on the wall of, of two ladders. And one ladder had an arrow that, that pointed up, and the other had a la an arrow that, that pointed down. And these ladders represented for me a choice, that I can climb up the ladder to get as, as high as I can go, to pass as many people as possible, or I can climb down the ladder. And, and this picture helped me day by day reappraise success, that to remember that my job was was not about being anything great, but it was about loving and serving the people of God, of, of climbing down the ladder. Paul's words in Philippians 2, we read a moment ago, come to mind. Do nothing out of, your, out, of, out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility value others above yourself. And really, this is what God has called all of us to do, is to resist the urge to climb up the ladder of life and to climb down it instead. The great paradox which scripture reveals, wrote Henry Nouwen, is that real and total freedom can only be found through downward mobility. You see, real and total freedom cannot be found through keeping every last ounce of grain for ourselves that real and total freedom can only be found through downward mobility. And so we have two men. We have Henry Nowen, and we have a barn building man. And the question becomes, which is the genius and which is the fool? And from the top of the ladder, the choice seems clear, that the rich man is the genius in Henry Nowen is a fool. But in God's upside down kingdom, the verdict is flipped that Henry Nowen is a genius and that the rich man is a fool. What does this have to do with witness? Friends, this has everything to do with witness. You see, as, as Jesus finished his story of the rich man in the barn and as the interrupter slipped back into the crowd, the disciples must have had a moment where they said, 
what were we talking about before all of that? What were we talking about? But yeah, J Jesus, you were telling us about be strong, bear witness. The Holy Spirit will be with us. Let's get back to talking about witness. But witness is a toddler that won't stay in his room. Because you see, Jesus hadn't stopped talking about witness. Jesus had not veered from talking about witness to talking about possessions, and, and now here we go back to witness. No, it was witness all along. Because how we manage our possessions is a form of witness. See, when you and I refuse to follow in the steps of the rich man, then we are agreeing with Jesus that life does not consist in an abundance of possessions, that we are witnesses that life is found somewhere else. And we can store up our treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves steal, or we can store them in a place where there is no decay. And when you and I choose the ladder, the downward ladder, then we become witnesses who declare that real and total freedom can only be found through the downward way. So witness can be words. Yes, witness needs to be words. But words are empty when not attached to a life of witness. And deeds can be words. Yes, faith without deeds is, is dead. But deeds are often isolated and occasional. What better witness than to climb down the ladder of life and in doing so to bring power and credibility and influence to our words and to our deeds. Downward mobility is not an evangelistic strategy. It's not something that we do just so that we can get people to go where we want them to go. No, we become downwardly mobile because we follow Jesus, the inventor of downward mobility. Philippians 2, once again, Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing by taking the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus was the truly downwardly mobile man. That Jesus could have stayed at the top of the ladder, but he descended to the very bottom. And as he made his way down, he stared straight into the eyes of the people who were planning to take his life. When everything else within us would have said, never mind, I'm climbing up from here, that he looked into their eyes and he, he kept climbing down toward cross. And so when you and I claim that science, climb that same ladder down, we are following in the footsteps of Jesus, that our downward mobility witnesses to a downwardly mobile God. And as we descend, we too, from time to time, will have moments when everything within us says, never mind, that's where I draw the line. I am climbing up from here. But will we be willing to follow Jesus past the margin of cushion, beyond the point of comfortable, into the realm of sacrifice. See, Jesus didn't climb the ladder down so we don't have to. Jesus climbed the ladder down and invited us to follow him in his pattern of descent. But we can just descend with him in good faith because we know that just as Jesus has been exalted, so too resurrection awaits everyone who participates in his death. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 4, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be also revealed in our mortal body. See, our downward mobility witnesses to a downwardly mobile God. So, what might downwardly, downward mobility look like in our own lives? Well, let's, let's put it this way. There are three ways to ride an elevator. Either you get on at the bottom floor and you can only go up. Friends, that's not us. 
or you get up at the top floor and you can only go down. And unless you bought Amazon this week and you didn't tell the Waco trip, it's none of us either. And so instead, we all approach the elevator somewhere between floors two and 99. And what that means is that when we come up to the doors, that we have a choice to make. Are we going up or are we going down? And the question becomes, which button will we press? Which direction will we climb? God may not be calling you to go from floor 95 to floor 5, like he called Henry Nowen, though he might. God may call you to descend two floors or, or 10, five floors or 50, but regardless of the number, the question is, will you and I be obedient? And before we start hoping that our descent won't be very far, may we remember that the further we plunge, the freer we'll be. Because our descent may stop at floor two, or it may stop at floor 92. But what's more important than our floor number is our direction. That no matter what we have, whether it's, it's much or it's few, will we use it to build cushion? Or will we use it to bless others? Our downward mobility witnesses to a downwardly mobile God. When you came in today, uh, you were handed a guide that looks like this. And on the front, it says, witness 24-7. Would, would you grab that and would you, would you take a look at it with me? This booklet is our attempt to bring clarity to what our church is, is doing when it comes to missions. It's our attempt to, to organize the whole and to mobilize our church to make a, a greater impact. And so as you flip through these pages, uh, you'll begin to see the significance of the numbers. And it, it's that we have, are presenting you with uh, two opportunities this school year uh, to be a witness through international ministries, four opportunities uh, through national partnerships, and seven opportunities to get involved in, in local ministries. I, I would encourage you to see these as opportunities uh, to live a downwardly mobile life. And, and my prayer and, and my hope for you is, is that you'll read through this, this guide, guide as you have time, and that you will find an opportunity that, that seems like it's the right fit from you. Because all of us have a role to play in the church. And you may know what that role is today. You can fill this out, or you may need to take this home and think about it for a little while. But, but when you're ready, we would ask that you would fill out this, this little card that you found and popped out of your bulletin today. Uh, fill that out. Let us know how you would like to get involved, and if you would turn that in at the desk uh, right outside. We're asking you to, to think about this for, for a few weeks. Respond when you're ready, but, but let us know by the end of October uh, when you know how you'd like to participate. That's part one of Witness 24-7, but the, the other part is this, is that beyond giving you two and four and seven opportunities to serve, that we want to equip you to be a witness 24-7 through the rhythms of your everyday life. Because, you know, trips are, are fun and, and projects are great, but if they are not attached to lives that resemble the downwardly mobile Jesus, then we're missing it. So if you look at this front left page of, of your guide, uh, most of the way down, you'll see three icons toward the bottom. And those icons are labeled where you work, where you live, and where you play. These three icons represent where you and I spend uh, nearly all of our time. And in these places, you and I are automatically and inevitably witnesses. That we don't get to choose whether we will be a witness in these places. We only question is what kind of witness that we will be. And so while we are eager for you to, to think about coming with us to Refugio or to Ecuador, to, to pray about reading to elementary school kids or to picking up a prescription for a community resident, that we're more, even more eager to be a church who thinks seriously about what it means to be a witness 24-7. So church, let's be a church who grips the ladder with both hands, and whose feet move downward. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for Jesus, that he has given us the pattern to imitate, that he is our Savior, 
that he has come down to us and that he has made a way for us to be with him. And Lord, you have called us to follow in your steps and to participate in your descent. And Lord, may you give us vision to, to know what this may look like in each of our lives. May you call us. We know that you're calling us downward. Would you tell us where to go and what this may look like? We're your people. We're your servants. We're listening. We're ready. We're ready to follow you. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I would like to uh, introduce to you all Stephen and Jenny Bolick. Stephen and Jenny will be familiar to many of you. Uh, Stephen has been our AV technician here for a number of years, been part of the Fifth Street Band, and Jenny has come faithfully along with him. But several weeks ago during this series on pillars, as we uh, heard from Matt the sermon about that pillar of community and belonging to the church, uh, the Spirit worked in Jenny and Stephen's life, and they realized God was calling them to place their membership here at First Baptist. And so Stephen comes uh, on promise of a letter from a sister Baptist church, and uh, Jenny comes along with him seeking membership by watch care with us. And so if you all will welcome them as candidates for membership and also uh, pledge in covenant with them to support and encourage them in their uh, continued following of Christ and work of witness. Will you say amen together with me? Amen. amen. Uh, Stephen and Jenny, you all stay right here. Uh, now, uh, would like to invite you to stand with me as we share our benediction together. Uh, this week, our benediction uh, 
will take the form of our church's mission statement. You will find it printed in your worship guide. I invite you to, to read it together with me as a, a renewal of that pledge of our work of witness. First Baptist Church Waco exists to lead all generations to love God, one another, and the world in the spirit of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>